Hey everybody, welcome back to Business Blaze. I'm your host, Simon, as always, and in today's This Is Thick, do not worry, we won't be here all day. It's got some pictures. How exciting. I will throw these pictures up on the screen for you so you can share in my enjoyment. Thank you, Danny, for putting this one together. It's one I requested. It's six failures from Apple, which he's entitled The Six Truly Rotten Failures from Apple, which is very clever, Danny. Well done. Oh, uh, just before we get started, like this video. <laughs> I'm just kidding, you don't have to like it before you've actually seen it. If you've got suggestions though, use the comments, and while you're down there, you, you may as well like it. In late 2018, Apple Inc., better known as Apple, but Inc. as well, entered the history books yet again, becoming the first ever publicly traded company in the US to be worth a staggering $1 trillion. Over the past four decades, the modest computer business founded by Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak in 1976 has evolved into one of the most globally successful and innovative companies companies of all time. Well, I feel like they were innovative for a while. I don't really feel like the latest iPad's a great innovation. Was the watch really? The innovation died with Steve. Uh, Just consider all the game-changing... Oh no, Danny's gonna contradict me. Just consider all the game-changing products Apple and services that Apple has brought you over the years. Uh, think the iPhone, the iPod, the iPad, iTunes. iTunes sucks. But all these things are old. iTunes really sucks. I didn't get into Apple for the longest time because the one piece of Apple software I had on the PC, the iTunes, was a hilarious piece of shit. Pretty much anything good beginning with a small i. Think the Apple II, the Macintosh, the App MacBook, the Apple Watch, Apple TV. It's difficult to think of any other company which has had such a revolutionary genius at its very core and rolled out so many leading edge products over such a long period of time. I do agree. A lot of this stuff is pretty amazing. But here's something to chew over the next time you're having a bad day. Even the mighty planet-conquering Apple have regularly experienced their bad days, wrong turns, and jaw-dropping disasters over the last 40 years. 40 years, Jesus. Yeah, 1976. Steve Jobs himself once proudly declared that you've got to be willing to crash and burn if you're afraid of failing, you won't get very far. So in chronological order, let's sink our teeth into some of Apple's most memorable flops, failures, and quite literal meltdowns. The Apple III from 1980. Look at that thing. Sexy. The original Apple computer was launched in 1976 and entirely built by hand by Steve Wozniak. The base kit concept didn't even include a monitor or keyboard and nowadays wouldn't even be classed, classed as a complete personal computer. It attracted the attention of about seven people, <laughs> all of whom were weird. <laughs> However, fast forward just one year and the Apple II was the product that, the fir that first put the company squarely on the map, becoming the first home computer to shift over five million units. But fast forward more years to 1980 and the doomed Apple III came close to sending the company back into oblivion forever. Wow, that's really incredible. Like one, rub, no, no success. Two, absolute boom. Three, let's see. The Apple III was mainly intended for business use, featuring a large screen display and extended keyboard functions. It cost about $8,000 to get your hands on one of these clunky beasts, so it certainly wasn't the machine of choice if you just wanted to play Space Invaders with the kids. Yeah, no sh like $8,000 today is outrageously expensive, and this is like 1970s dollars. It's gotta be like triple the price at least. Steve Jobs had a vision of a quiet computer, which would be built in an aluminium case to help th keep things cool without the need for the usual noisy fans and vents. Well, that was the theory. In reality, the computer overheated very quickly, the chips melted out of their sockets, and even the floppy disks suffered from heat damage. Well, that's not good. There were tons of other problems too. I feel only recently, I, I got this, uh, the, the Mac book whatever it is last year the year before whenever they release that new version and this was the first time that i've really had a computer i don't think i've ever heard the fan on that thing kick on one particular issue was chips randomly falling out of their sockets and that was solved by apple with perhaps one of the most ludicrous official fixes ever released to the public apple's high-tech recommendation was for users to simply lift their computer about three inches in the air and then drop it on the desk so that chips would hopefully slot back into the right place. Is that really a solution? I feel like with hard disks, especially like in the 1970s, that's not gonna be a good time. Like you can just imagine, you know, that, that terrifying sound of like you drop it and then it's like, weak, weak. Wee! I don't know if you guys have ever had a hard disk fail on you, but uh, that's a terrifying sound that you don't want. One day, this channel will be sponsored by Backblaze, and it's at this point that I would transition into a sponsor read, which I'm not gonna do. You can imagine how tempting it must have been for a frustrated business owner just to lob it out of the window instead. Yeah, I can imagine if they said to me, yeah, you just need to drop it, I'd be like, good. Oh, nice break. That moment of regret where like, I think I've broken at least two mice where I'm like, oh, come on. And it's like, oh, now I have to go to the store and buy a new mouse because they need it now. 
Ultimately, the Apple III had a 100% failure rate because every single unit had, had to be repaired in some way. And just to make matters worse, some of those repairs and replacements completely failed too. <laughs> this is not a good time, Apple, is it? Steve Jobs once claimed that Apple lost infinite, incalculable amounts of money on the devastating failure of Apple III. Well, Steve wasn't good at maths because he was rich, but he didn't have infinite money. Therefore, he didn't lose infinite money. I'm sure it's just a figure of speech, but it was it was wrong. But he shouldn't have really got quite so down in the dumps about it. The true figure was only about sixty million dollars. Next one up, the Apple Newton from 1993. Look at that sexy beast. That's like the. Do you guys remember Palm Pilots? I I used to always get my dad's old stuff. So I had like a Palm Pilot. I had a Scion. You know, P S I O N uh, three something. Like my dad would always have these things, and then he'd pass them on to me, and I'd be very excited about having like the ch generation of technology from five years ago. And I'm thinking like as a kid, I'm going to organize my school schedule on this. I'm so business like. Nearly 20 years before the iPad took the world by storm, there was the Apple Newton. Back in 1993, even before the standard laptop had yet to surface and mobile phones were still the size of a brick, Apple's concept of a pocket-sized personal digital assistant was intended to kick off the digital revolution in handheld tech. I've never heard of this thing. I'm going to guess it, and, and seeing as this is like a video about rotten failures, I'm going to guess it didn't kick off that revolution. The idea was sound enough. I mean, it was. It looks like something that came along later, or came along at the same time. It just wasn't by Apple. The Newton could not only send emails, store notes, and manage calendars, this futuristic device also included a handwriting feature. So the user could quickly scribble down notes on the screen using a stylus, and then Newton would translate your handwriting into digital text. I have to say, this is a bit of a tangent, but I'm quite upset with Apple right now. I recently upgraded to the uh, the new the new iPad, this thing, whatever this guy is, um, the iPad Pro, and I had the previous one, which in fact broke, and they gave me a new one, on, or they gave me my money back on warranty, so I upgraded to the new one, and I had the stylus with the old one. It doesn't work with the new iPad. So I've got to buy like another hundred pound stylus. It's ridiculous. The Newton would translate your handwriting into digital text. I remember this. Like you'd have to draw in a little box at the bottom, like A, and then it would put an A up on screen. B. Put a B up on screen. I wasn't really sure what this was useful for. I'd just rather tap at the keyboard. Apple's bold marketing claim at the time was that the Newton could take notes as easily as a piece of paper. The problem? It was <laughs> It says rubbish, but I wanted to add emphasis with a swear word, and I'll bleep it out so I can store any money off this video. You would have been better off saving wads of cash for just using a piece of paper. The handwriting recognition just didn't work, and often resulted in a mess of completely indecipherable gibberish. Yeah, even now, like when I was using the pencil, the Apple Pencil on my old iPad, it's like I never use the translate to text feature, because even then it kind of sucks, and I can read my own handwriting, so I'm fine. It quickly became a laughing stock and was stock and was ripped to shred on high-profile platforms such as Saturday Night Live. Wow, it must have been bad. You know, I kind of expect it was ripped to pieces by the reviewers in PC World or Apple World. And it's like, nah, this was bad enough that Saturday Night Live took it to pieces. Uh, also, the Doonesbury comic strip, never heard of that. And The Simpsons, never heard, no, I've heard of The Simpsons. The piss take on The Simpsons hit Apple particularly hard. The episode features the school bully Dolph. Is this school bully's name Dolph? Wasn't it Nelson? Oh no, Dolph's the tall guy, right? With the, that looks like a convict. I'm sure that's not a politically right correct way of describing how this guy looks, but he looks like a prisoner. Uh, Dolph trying to use the Newton to screw himself a reminder to beat up the teacher's pet, Martin. How innovative! I like it! When Beat Up Martin gets trans translated to Eat Up Martha... Hey Dolph, take a memo on your Newton. Beat up Martin. A frustrated Dolph decides to simply throw the Newton at Martin's head instead. That is kind of sounds well. This been like what this piece of crap was good for. The words "Eat Up Martha" allegedly haunted the corridors of Apple HQ for years to come, and later encouraged them to nail the perfect keypad for the iPhone to repeat to avoid any repeat humiliation. Maybe the Apple Newton was just way, way ahead of its time. I like how the handwriting recognition sucked so bad that now they have a keyboard. <laughs> Next one, Antenna Gate, 2010. Hey, what I remember. I remember Antenna Gate. Where I think it was like when you held the phone, it blocked it, but let's look into it. Here's another mighty flop, which doesn't just relate to a silly design flaw. It also relates to the equally silly manner in which Apple responded to it. The iPhone 4 made a dramatic splash when it first landed on the market in 2010, breaking all records on pre-orders and opening sales. But new consumers were quick to identify an unexpected problem. The handset dropped calls and frequently provided shocking 
shockingly poor reception in ways users had never experienced with previous models. Uh, yeah, I, I think I always buy my iPhones like a year later because I don't want to spend like a grand on a phone because it's absolutely absurd. Uh, so I think this had been solved by the time I actually got my hands on an iPhone 4, but I remember people complaining about this. It turns out that the reason was simple enough and it had all to do with the flawed design of the human body. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it was the human body that was a fault here. In their infinite wisdom, Apple had wrapped the antennas of the headset around the top sides and bottom of the phone. That was fine, but it meant that the reception often became blocked when somebody tried to phone with their pesky human hands and fingers. <laughs> ah, sarcasm, Danny, I see. Apple's response to the problem was disappointing to say the least. Instead of holding up their own defective human hands and admitting they've made a mistake, this is very nice, they simply tried to claim that users were holding the phone wrong. <laughs> Look, Apple, I'll hold the phone as I damn well please. I'll hold it, I, get, I, I just hold it in my pinky fingers like this, and you know, I expect it to work. In fact, you're just holding it wrong was the media headline that ricocheted around the world's press and prompted the mockery of Apple's PR department. Yeah, because it's horrible. Fortunately, Steve Jobs did eventually concede the design flaw on the iPhone 4 and the media dubbed Antennagate finally came to an end with the distribution of millions of free cases and bumpers from Apple which solved the problem. Which is fine, but I don't like cases. Like, I use a case on my phone only because I, uh, I've got a problem with breaking the screens and these little bumper cases actually do a great job. That's why. But I don't want to have to use a case, like if I don't want to. Like, I didn't use cases for the longest time because I think it ruins the aesthetic of the phone. Then just replacing screens became too expensive. But it's perhaps another more recent example of Apple's tendency to think of style first and the ability to be used by members of the human race second. I, just this, this entry ends here. But I remember it being that the design flaw got by because when they were testing the phone in public, they had these cases which disguised the phone. So, you know, because the Apple 4 looks, Apple iPhone 4 looked really different to the 3. So they would have like their test users use it in like a bulky case. And then that case was allowing it to work fine. And then as soon as it was, you know, not being a secret thing and people were actually holding it, it went wrong. Not sure if that's correct. It wasn't in the script, but I think that was why it went wrong. Anyway, moving on. Apple Maps. Another one I remember. 2012. Right. I asked Danny to put images in if he wanted to, and he's just used a meme of lost predators. Taking on the power and popularity of the long-established Google Maps was always going to be a tough challenge for any rival company. But even so, it was still a surprise to see just how badly Apple cocked it up on their first attempt in 2012. The almost endless flaws and glitches and design quirks became the stuff of comic legends, including a remarkably squashed flat Eiffel Tower. The weird and wonderful warping of landscapes often gave the impression of a very bad acid trip on a psychedelic alien planet. Probably like where the predators come from. Alarmingly bendy bridges which would never have realistically passed the most basic of safety tests. Several completely blank and empty areas which presumably represented places that nobody cared about enough to visit. A worrying recommendation from the app was that the best way to enter Fairbanks International Airport was to simply drive across one of the busy runways. <laughs> Apple made a fair few corrections to the app after onboarding, absorbing initial customer feedback feedback. In fact, they had to make no less than 2.5 million changes in total. Years later, Apple Maps is still not considered a major contender to topple Google Maps from its throne. Does anyone actually use Apple? Apple Maps is what happens when someone sends me a location on WhatsApp and I click on it and I go to Apple Maps and I have to copy the address over to Google Maps. That's why that's the only time I use Apple Maps. But thankfully, it's improved significantly since the disastrous lot. You know, I don't care. I'm never going to use it. Google Maps is awesome. Waze is even better. I threw that page away dramatically, but there's the whole last entry. I just use Waze and Google Maps. I don't really feel like, just Apple, just give up. It's okay. You know, focus on that new credit card that no one likes. The U2 album that not everybody wanted, 2014. I like the fact that it's not all super old ones that I don't remember. I remember this one. I hated this. On my last iPhone, I went on a road trip with my friend and we rented a car and it had one of those, um, you know, USB things that you plug into your phone and then it'll automatically start playing whatever's on your iPhone. And I have Spotify and then I have the one YouTube album, on, uh, YouTube, the one YouTube album on my phone that they just automatically loaded onto it. So every time, Every time we got into the car, we'd plug in the phone and it was like da 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 da
Because every time, then you'd have to go and choose something you actually wanted to listen to on Spotify, but every time, so bad. Oh, it was meant to be the most generous giveaway in music history. It's not generous if no one wants it, Steve. 2014, was Steve still alive? Uh, but it ended up being viewed as the most unwelcome spamming campaign in marketing history. The brand new album from U2, Songs of Innocence, was released in 2014, but it certainly didn't get distributed via the traditional channels. In a move that took the market and the world by surprise, it was given away completely free to 500 million users of iTunes. That's, I guess, everyone who uses iTunes. It automatically downloaded itself to iPhones and devices around the globe. It certainly seemed a bit of a U-turn for U2. Just a few years earlier, the band's manager, Paul McGuinness, had been publicly complaining about the concept of free downloads. Back then, he said, We are living in an era when free is decimating the music industry and is starting to do the same to film, TV, and books. What has gone so wrong? Wow, Paul, you were wrong. <laughs> Who paid to watch this video? Nobody! <laughs> Who's getting paid for you watching this video? Simon! <laughs> this was something very different and new, though. At the time, some people may have questioned the logic of giving away the new hotly anticipated album for one of the world's biggest rock bands for free and losing out on more than a million full price sales. But you two were considering the bigger picture. It was estimated that the move would generate around $100 million in high profile marketing, promote the next world tour, and generate millions of new sales from YouTube back catalogue. I forgive them, not that they need my forgiveness, but I forgive them because this does seem smart and I don't think you could really predict the horrific backlash and just the, the complete f here. It didn't quite work out as planned. No. Uh, the problem is that not everyone likes U2. I like U2. I mean, I liked All That You Can't Leave Behind, and I liked The Joshua Tree. I didn't really like anything else, like older or newer. And I know people don't like All You Can't Leave Behind, but I think that's one of the finest albums ever made. Judge me now. <laughs> Use the comments. Also, another album you can judge me on. I think, uh, what's it called? Echo Park from Feeder is a fine album. People don't like it. And I think it's amazing. He's got a brand new car. <laughs> Looks like a Jag. You are solid rhyming there, Feeder. <laughs> In fact, it turns out that some people can't stand U2. U2 may well pull in millions of adoring fans, but they also seem to inspire hatred from a section of the population who just find Bono to be the most annoying and arrogant man to ever walk the earth. I don't think Bono comes across as arrogant. I listened to an interview with him the other day. I mean, he wants to change the world. He seems like a genuinely good guy. He's got annoying sunglasses, but doesn't he have some problem with his eyes? <laughs> if he doesn't have problem with his eyes, those sunglasses are a bit weird. But I think he has problems with his eyes. Let me know in the comments. A Bono's eyes. Millions of iTunes users felt deeply aggrieved that this YouTube album had popped up in their personal and private music library without any warning or consent. And to make matters worse, nobody could get rid of the damn thing. Yes, we. Did. I desperately tried. It kept coming back. It was just there, like an embarrassing Wombles record your from your childhood that super glued to the top of your turntable. You get Americans know the Wombles. I feel like that's a British thing, like the Wombles of Wimbledon. Is that the Wombles? Or is that a completely different thing? I don't know. Bono was quick to apologize for the mistake, explaining the reasoning behind the move had involved megalomania, a touch of generosity, a dash of self-promotion, and a deep fear that these songs we poured our life into over the last few years might not be heard. Incidentally, only 6,700 sales from U2's back catalog were generated. 500 million free albums, 6,700 pay sales. That's slightly embarrassing. Apple were also compelled to release a tool that got rid of the album. There was a tool that got rid of this album? Where was this? Along with a dedicated website which gave step-by-step -step instructions on how to delete the U2 album from your devices and your life. I wish I'd found that. You see, you can't help but feeling a little sympathy for Apple over this one, as they got their fingers burned by simply trying to give away something of potential value for free. But to some customers, it felt more like Apple were lobbing a bono-shaped brick through their window. It did. Okay, there are bonus cock- I didn't even ask for bonus cock-ups. Thanks, Danny. This one's already super long. Bonus cock-ups. Number one, who doesn't like a big juicy price cut? Early purchases, the very first iPhone didn't. Oh. Just two months after the original iPhone was released in 2007, Apple knocked a hefty $200 off the price tag. This not only smacked of panic and desperation, but it annoyed the loyal customers who paid full whack just weeks earlier. Apple eventually offered $100 in credit to anyone who had paid the full price, but stayed well clear of discounts in the future. That feels like a bit of a slap in the face. I'm a super loyal customer. Yeah, we're gonna, we're gonna 
price it up for you. <laughs> I mean, the economics makes sense. I suppose the whole thing makes sense because people still absolutely rage love for Apple. Uh, number two, like, but like I say, I will never buy anything from the new. I always buy my phone second and a year later because I'm cheap. Number two, we've all accidentally left our wallets or our car keys or our dignity in the bar. <laughs> I have done all of those things many times. But it proved to be particularly problematic for Apple engineer Gray Powell when he left his phone at a bar in 2010. The phone was actually a prototype of the forthcoming iPhone 4, probably the one with that case on it that made it actually work. And it ended up getting sneakily sold to the tech site Gizmodo, who expo exposed all the details of the new handset weeks before Apple officially unveiled it. Number three, there's an app for that, was a popular marketing slogan used by Apple back in 2009 to promote the fact that you could find an app for pretty much anything on their new range of iPhones. But if Steve Jobs had got his way in the beginning, there would barely be an app for anything. He initially announced that third-party developers would not be able to create apps for the, locked down, for, locked, for the lockdown devices, as he was concerned about inferior software flooding the App Store. Fortunately, he was persuaded to change his mind, and the rest is history. An app store full of inferior products. When the Apple Store first opened in 2008, only 500 apps were available. Today, thanks to the involvement of third-party developers, the store features 2.2 million apps. That's a lot of apps. Number four. Finally, here is a memorable controversy that in truth seemed to be massively overinflated. And that's Bendygate. Oh yeah, I remember this. People were bending their iPhones. I never found this to be a problem. Uh, following the release of the iPhone 6 Plus, some customers complained that the latest handset was far too flimsy and bent out of shape very quickly. Pictures and videos started popping up all over social media, showing very noticeable bends in the middle of the ultra-thin phone. However, the truth of the matter was that the devices had been thoroughly tested without problem, and only nine people people ever complained, most of whom had accidentally sat on their new phones. Yeah, I feel like if you sat on the phone and it just didn't outright break, you know, that's a lucky break. If it's just a little bit bent, just deal with it. Still, it's worth noting that all later versions of the phones were produced from much tougher aluminium, or aluminum, as you Americans would say. So there was something, maybe there was something in it after all. Yeah, maybe. Nine people, nine people complained. Who cares? It's never a big problem. This has been Business Place. This was a long one. That was a beast of a script. Thank you, Danny, for putting it together. If you've got a suggestion for a future Business Place video that you would like me to tackle, post it in the comments below. Upvote the ones you like. Also, like this video, subscribe to this channel. It's new. Hit the bell. All of that good stuff. And I'll see you next time.